Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wal aqibatu lil muttaqin Wala udwana illa ala al-zalimin Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ilahu al-awwalin wal akhirin Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Ballagha al-risalah Wa adda al-amanah Wa nasaha al-ummah وجاهد في سبيل الله حق جهاده وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار My respected brothers and sisters in Islam from one of the most amazing attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the, one of the most amazing sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is His attribute of knowledge. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that will be, everything that was, everything that would have been, if it were to be. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is not preceded by ignorance, just like our knowledge. No, rather it is not preceded by ignorance. Neither is it, is it superseded by forgetfulness like, we, like our knowledge. Rather Allah does not forget, neither, did, neither was there ever a time that he did not know. From these, from this knowledge, from the complete, completeness of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is his knowledge of that which will be until the day of judgment. That which will be until the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Alimul Ghaib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who knows the unseen. Alimul Ghaib. Fala yudhiru ala ghaibihi ahada. So he does not let anyone know about the ghaib, about the unseen. Anyone at all. Illa man irtada min rasul. Except for the one that Allah wills from the, messen from the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning the angels and the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent to this dunya. So from, from this knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had shared with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the knowledge of the unseen is the hadith that we find in Bukhari that, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa once he got up and prayed Fajr, Fajr prayer, you know, he led the Fajr prayer in his mosque. Thereafter, he got up on the mimbar and he started to talk. He started to give a khutbah until Dhuhr time. Until what? Dhuhr time. This is approximately seven, eight hours he was talking. Seven, eight hours the khutbah. Then he got down from the mimbar and he prayed his Dhuhr prayer. Then he got up again. He got up again and he started talking and he started giving the khutbah until Asr prayer. Then he got down again. He got down and he prayed his Asr prayer. Then he got up again and he started to talk until the sun went down, until Maghrib prayer. Subhanallah, the whole day, the companions who reported this hadith reported that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that particular day mentioned every single thing that will happen to this ummah until the day of judgment. Every single thing that he, can, that he can think of. He mentioned until the day of judgment. Everything that will happen to this ummah from the leaders that will rule it, from the people how they, how will, how they will be, from the uh, uh, disasters that will, that will take place until the day of judgment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described in the greatest detail in that day, in that whole day from the sunrise until sunset. So, from this, from the prophecies of Rasulullah we find that Rasulullah had prophesied a lot of things that will happen to this ummah. 
From these prophecies, let me give you an example, is the hadith of the Mawaqeet of Hajj. You know, the hadith of Mawaqeet of Hajj are very, very amazing. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, as in the hadith of Ibn Umar in, uh, in Bukhari, he mentioned that uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions, وَقَّتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ then he mentioned what did Rasulullah sallallahu do, do tawqeet of. When you mean miqat, you mean the place in which the people, they, ha- they make the intention, and from that intention, from that place, they, they make the intention loudly, and then thereafter they go on and do hajj and umrah. From these places that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi made miqat of was Dhul Halayfa for Medina. Then he made Qarn Manazil for the people of Hijaz. And look at this, he made Yalamlam for people of Yemen. And then he made Juhfa, this place called Juhfa, for the people of Sham. What is Sham? Sham is Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, parts of Turkey, uh, Palestine. This is Sham. And also he made this place called Dhat Irqin, Dhat Irq, for the people of Iraq. Now my question to you today is, were there Muslims in Sham and Iraq at that time? Were there Muslims there? No. Who was in Iraq at that time? The force at that time, isn't it? The force was in Iraq at that time. And what about in Sham? The Romans in Sham, weren't they? The Roman Christians were in Sham. So subhanallah, we find the Rasulullah even in this hadith, he had prophesied that there would be Muslims from Iraq who would come and so therefore he, he left, he, he made a place for, uh, uh, for a miqat for them. And he prophesied as well in this same hadith that there will be Muslims in Sham. And so he left a miqat for them as well, subhanallah. From the prophecies of Rasulullah sallallahu is that Islam will, will, will win. Is that the future is for Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Katab Allahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written. When did Allah write it? Allah wrote this 50,000 years before He created the heavens and the earth. Katab Allahu, la aghli banna ana wa rusuli. Inna Allah qawiyun aziz. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 50,000 years before everything was created, wrote in the Lawh al Mahfuz that Allah and His messengers will be the ones who win. They will be the ultimate victorious people. They are the ult- uh, ultimate, ultimate winners. So we know that the victory will be for Islam. Also Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said an authentic hadith, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين على الحق لا يضرهم من خذلهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم على ذلك. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said an authentic hadith in Bukhari as well. There will never cease to be a group amongst my ummah who will always be upon the truth. No harm will ever reach them from those people who try and betray them. And they will continue to be upon this truth until the truth comes to them, until the amur of Allah comes to them. And what is this amur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is the smoke that will come from Yemen to take their souls away. As is explained in another authentic narration in Abi Dawood. From these prophecies of Rasulullah is that a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdullah from the lineage of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha this man he will come and he will lead this ummah and he will raise this ummah from the depths that we have put ourselves in this is the prophecy that we want to discuss today and that is the Mahdi the Mahdi who is the Mahdi what is the Mahdi the word Mahdi my brothers and sisters in Islam comes from the word Huda the word guidance. So the word Mahdi means ism fa'il, it is the doer of, 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 of Hidayah, the one upon whom the, 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 the Huda is done. Therefore, the Mahdi is someone, ism mafu'il, the one. So the Mahdi is someone who Allah has done Huda upon, meaning Allah has guided. So the Mahdi is the person who is guided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned and used the word Mahdi in, many, in numerous times. So Rasulullah sallallahu has used the word Mahdi. Numerous times, it's, it's important for us to understand that the word Mahdi means a characteristic of being guided. It doesn't mean, as other people say, as, as, as other people think, that his name will be Mahdi. His name will be the Mahdi. No, it is only a characteristic of that person. And as we will, as we will soon come to, the Mahdi will never say he's a Mahdi. The Mahdi will never claim to be the Mahdi. And that is one of the signs of the true Mahdi, that he will never claim to be the Mahdi. And as we will come to, inshallah, the greatest Liars who ever presumed or who ever told the people that they, that they were the Mahdi always said we were the Mahdi. And that was one of the signs that the ulema used to say that no, that therefore you're not the Mahdi. Because you said you're the Mahdi, you're not the Mahdi. Okay? So Rasulullah for example, 
He tells us in the authentic hadith, Yushiku man aasha min ba'di an yalqa Isa ibn Maryam imaman mahdiyan hakama. Rasulullah sallallahu said in this authentic hadith in Musnad Imam Ahmed, he said it is just about the people who live after me are just about to meet Isa ibn Maryam imaman, he will be an imam, mahdiyan, he will be guided, so he will guide the people to the truth. Hakama, he will be a leader. And also we find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in an authentic hadith in Tirmidhi. He says about Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Oh Allah, when once when Muawiyah radiallahu anhu came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi he said, Ya Allah, wahdi bihi. He said, Oh Allah, make him a righteous man, make him a guider, make him guided and guide by him. So we find this word Mahdi being used in the Quran to mean this characteristic of being guided or guiding other people. Now as far as the ahadith of Mahdi are concerned, as far as the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu regarding the Mahdi are concerned, then the ulama are of two madhabs in this. The ulama have two separate opinions. There are some of these ulama who consider all these ahadith to be not authentic. They consider this idea of, of the Mahdi to be a figment of imagination. They say that the Mahdi was a figment of the imagination of the Shia or that the Shia made, made them up and they, and they distorted the picture of the Mahdi and they put all these false ahadith of Rasulullah attributing them to Rasulullah about the Mahdi. And this is the reason why these scholars such as Ibn Khaldun rahimahullah, in his Muqaddimah for example and as you know Tariq Ibn Khaldun which is one of the most important books in, of, of, of history Ibn Khaldun was of this opinion and also uh, uh, you know, a couple of... Uh, uh, Decades before, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida as well was of this opinion that the, the Mahdi or the concept of the Mahdi is a figment of the imagination. Why did they say that? For a number of reasons. First and foremost, they said that there is no hadith in the Mahdi in Bukhari and Muslim. Which is true. There is no hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that mentions the Mahdi by name. Have you noticed that? Right? Of course, first of all, there is no ayah in the Quran. Secondly, there is no hadith in Bukhari Muslim that mentions the Mahdi by the name. Yes, it mentions that there will be a man from my ummah, etc., etc., in, you know, in vague terms. But nothing uh, uh, specific, clear, spot on uh, about the Mahdi. Nothing at all in, the, in Bukhari and Muslim. However, of course, this is a weak, weak doubt, isn't it? Because of the fact that Bukhari Muslim never uh, made it a condition upon themselves to narrate every single authentic hadith. Rather, the only condition they put upon themselves were strict conditions in order to actually they only included in their, in their uh, two books only a hadith that fulfilled their strict conditions. But doesn't mean that there were other authentic hadith. And so this doubt, this doubt that they had is quite weak. Secondly, the second doubt that they had was that they used to say that the, uh, uh, the ahadith about the Mahdi have Shia narrators. Some of the narrators in the ahadith of the Mahdi are Shia. And we know the Shia are, are very extreme. And we know their, their, their view and their uh, belief about the Mahdi are very, very extreme. So they said that some of the ahadith, the, some of the narrators in these ahadith are Shia. However, if you look at it, in fact, in reality, there are approximately 30 authentic hadith about the Mahdi and about 16 narrations from the companions and the Salaf which are authentic about the Mahdi. So in total, we have 46 different proofs about the Mahdi. From these 30 hadith, about 7 of these hadith have Shia narrators. 7 out of 30. So 23 therefore don't have Shia narrators. True or not? So therefore the majority of the hadith of Rasulullah which are authentic don't have Shia narrators in them. And we have 16 narrations from the companions of them. 4 of, the, of these narrations, 4 out of the 12 of the narrations from the companions have Shia narrators. So therefore to say that therefore to just to use this as a doubt to to throw away all the uh, hadith of the, of, the, of the Mahdi is false because as we, as we just proved most of the narrations from Rasulullah don't have Shia narrators. Also another example that they gave was that the concept of the Mahdi or the theory of the Mahdi led to a lot of fitna in this ummah. Which is true. Which is true. It did lead to a lot of fitna. We will come to that very very soon. In fact, some of the people who claim to be Mahdi were, the, were, were worse than Hajjad bin Yusuf. The Hajjad bin Yusuf was a very evil man. He killed the ulama, he pillaged Medina, he raped a thousand women, his people, uh, his, uh, uh, the, the army under his control raped a thousand women and killed a thousand ulama in Medina 
after which Medina would never rise up again, never would have ceased to be the, the capitals of the Muslims because of the pillage of Hajjaj. And then he was also the first to destroy the Kaaba. He was the first to actually catapult stones into the Kaaba and destroy it, into, Medi into, into Mecca and destroy it. Subhanallah, Hajjaj bin Yusuf. But of course, he had one good deed. What was his good deed? Does anybody know what his good deed was? Sorry? He put the dots on the Alif Bata. <laughs> you know the Ba? When you, put a, when you put a Ba, so you put a one dot, so that people know it's a Ba. And when it's a Ta, you put two dots on top, so you know it's a Ta. Okay? So that was his contribution to Islam. But this has been drowned. This good deed of his, mashallah, now we, we use the Quran. We use this to read the Quran, mashallah. You know, ne next time you, you look at the dots, you say, mashallah, thank you, Hajjaj. But no, don't thank, don't, don't, don't thank him. Because his good deeds have been drowned in a sea and an ocean of bad deeds. Right? His good deeds have been drowned in an ocean or sea of bad deeds. And some of the Mahdi that, that had come to this Ummah were, were worse than Hajjaj bin Yusuf. We'll come to that very, very soon. So therefore, the doubts of these scholars, they say that this concept of the Mahdi led to fitna on the Ummah. We don't need it. But the reality of the fact is, if some people took this upon themselves and use it as a, as a, as a, as a platform to uh, put themselves in front of people, to say that they are the Mahdi in order for, you know, to use them for, for political reasons, this does not negate the fact that the, that the Mahdi itself is a, is a, uh, a suitable uh, concept in Islam. So this doubt of theirs is also therefore very weak. And one of the last doubts that they have, one of the major doubts that they have is that the Mahdi is a figment of the <laughs> Sufiya, is a, is a ploy by the Sufis because as you know the Sufis they believe in Aqtab, they believe in this Qutub in which uh, people around which the heavens and the earth rotate, okay, uh, and, and these people are, are the controllers of the heavens and the earth and they said therefore the Mahdi is similar to this, Mahdi is a figment of the imagination of the Sufiya. But let's look at the reality, what is the reality? I have just given you four or five different doubts and this is all weak. All these doubts are weak. What is the reality? The reality is, brothers and sisters in Islam, the hadith of Mahdi, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the Mahdi are mutawatir. Does anyone know what mutawatir means? What does mutawatir mean? Yes, mutawatir means that in every single level of the hadith, you have so many narrators in every level until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beginning from the person who wrote the hadith down, until Rasulullah says, and there were so many narrators that it's impossible for the hadith to be a lie. It's impossible, it's impossible. Naam. Use this word, impossible, for the hadith to be a lie. An example of this, for example, is the hadith of Raf al Yadain, of raising your hands before, before and after Rukur. Has been reported by the 10 people who have been promised Jannah. Who are they? The, 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 the 10 companions who have been promised Jannah. It has been reported by 70 companions of Rasulullah. 70 companions. Of Rasulullah SAW reported this hadith. This hadith is mutawatir. So it's absolutely impossible for anyone to deny the existence or, the, or, or, or deny the fact that Rasulullah SAW used to raise his hands before and after the court. In the same way, the hadith of the Mahdi, the hadith of the Dajjal, the hadith of Isa ibn Maryam, uh, 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 the hadith pertaining to these people are all mutawatir. It is impossible for them to be alive. From those ulama who said that these hadith are mutawatir, is for example, Qurtubi in his tathkirah, Al-Mizzi in Tahdib al-Kamal, Ibn al-Qayyim, in Manar al-Munif, Ibn Hajj al-Fatul-Bari, Al-Sakhawi in Fatul Mughith, Al-Shawkani in Tawdih, Siddiq Hassan Khan in Al-Idha'a, Mullah Ali Qari in Risalat al-Mahdi, Safarini in Lawami al-Anwar al-Bahiyya. So they, and I mentioned to you just now, 12 ulama, uh, 9 ulama, 9 of the scholars of Islam who have mentioned that the ahadith of Mahdi are mutawatir. Are mutawatir. So what is the benefit of knowing that the hadith of Mahdi are mutawatir? What is the benefit for us, the normal Tom, Dick and Harry? What, what is the benefit? The benefit is, brothers, of two types. The first benefit is that the hadith is that it is obligatory to believe in the authenticity of this hadith. It is, in, it is, is, it is not possible for us to doubt the authenticity of the hadith of Mahdi. The second faida, the second benefit knowing that the hadith of Mahdi are mutawatir, is that we must act according to it. We must first of all believe and then act according to it. It is obligatory on the Muslims to act according to it. So now that we have established this, let's move on to the main question that is the main question today. And that is, has the Mahdi already come? Did he come? Have you seen him? Has anyone seen him? Okay, has the Mahdi already come? And the second question is, 
if he hasn't uh, uh, come yet, then has he been born yet? You know, we hear all these stories that he's been already born and he's doing tawaf in Mecca. Have you heard these stories, guys? Yeah, and this woman saw a dream that she gave birth to the Mahdi and she went to Ali Rumi, this great uh, dream interpreter in Riyadh and said that, uh, you know, I've seen that, I've seen that I gave birth to the Mahdi and the Ali Rumi said, mashallah, well done. Yeah, obviously he said something else. And, uh, and we hear these stories quite a lot, don't we? So is this the case that the Mahdi has been born? It's okay, it happens, it happens guys, it happens. <laughs> okay, has the Mahdi already come? There are two parts to this question, two answers to this question. First of all, there are some people who claim to be the Mahdi and I want to discuss five people and I want to tell you and, and, and mention to you five of those people who claim to be Mahdi and how we can benefit from their story because when the Mahdi truly does come, we don't want to fall into the trap, do we? We don't want to fall into the trap and be from those guys who are misguided, no. When the Mahdi does come, we want to know who the Mahdi truly is and how can we do so? How can we know what is dark if you don't know what is light? How can you know what is uh, uh, Tawheed if you don't know what is Shirk? So let us try and find out who these people, these false Mahdi, Mahdi were that, that, we're going, that we're going to talk about and why they were false Mahdi's and from that we will learn how the true Mahdi will truly be. From these false Mahdi, the first one was the, a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Mansur al-Abbasi. Muhammad ibn Abdullah, obviously they all name, all, you know, everyone knows their name. What's it going to be? Muhammad Abdullah. If it's not going to be Muhammad Abdullah, there's not going to be Mahdi. So there you go. So all the five people I'm going to talk about, what are their names? Muhammad ibn Abdullah. There you go. However, of course, many of them, as you will soon find, the original names were not Muhammad ibn Abdullah. They actually changed it around. Okay, there was something else. Tarmat ibn Tarmat, this and that. And, and then they changed it around to make it into Muhammad Abdullah in order to fool the people into thinking that they were the Mahdi. Uh, are you having trouble from, this, from the sunlight? I don't want you to lose your eyesight, Akhi. Are you sure? Please, would you like to sit in the middle? Are you sure? Jazakallah khair. Okay. The first one is the Mahdi al-Abbasi. This is called the Mahdi al-Abbasi. Muhammad Abdullah al-Mansur, uh, Abi Ja'far al-Mansur. Shaykh al-Islam al-Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions in his fatawa that Muhammad Abdullah, this person, his father by the name of al-Mansur was one of the uh, uh, Umayyad Khalifas. He wanted his son to be the Mahdi. So he changed his name and he changed the name of his son into fitting into the Hadith of Mahdi. So he called himself Abdullah and what did he call his son? Muhammad. Now Shaykh Nusayyid mentions the reason why this Khalifa, this Khalifa he did this was so that uh, because at that time there was a man by the name of Al-Nafs uh, uh, Al-Mazloom, uh, if I remember correctly. A man by the name of Al-Nafs Al-Mazloom who started to tell people that he was a Mahdi and so the Khalifa wanted to counteract that and he wanted his son to be the Mahdi. Why not? Huh? Don't we want our sons to be the Mahdi? So let's just change my name from Tawfiq to Abdullah so then change my son's name into, from Yusuf into Muhammad. You know, why not? It's a good idea, isn't it? This might be that he becomes a Mahdi. So he did that. And so Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah rahimullah mentioned in his fatawa many people who did that in order, in, in, you know, hoping that their, uh, 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 that their son will be the Mahdi. This man, Muhammad, Muhammad uh, Ibn Abdullah al-Mansur, al he, he ruled over the Muslims for about 11 years and he died in the year 169 after Hijrah. Then there comes the Mahdi. Uh, so let's talk, about, now we've talked about Mahdi from Sham, obviously because he was, ru he was ruling in Sham. Let's talk about the Mahdi of Maghrib. So, so we will talk about today five Mahdis. Mahdi of the Sham, Mahdi of the Maghrib, the Mahdi of the East, which is uh, in, in India, uh, and we will talk about Mahdi of Sudan, and we will talk about Mahdi of Saudi Arabia. Oh, we can't forget Saudi Arabia, can we? Okay, Saudi Arabia, okay? So the first, the second Mahdi is therefore the Mahdi al-Maghribi. He is known as the Mahdi al-Maghribi. And he is, what's his name? Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Tirmid. Okay, so we call him ibn Tirmid just to uh, uh, specify him and so that people can know who he is. Ibn Tirmid, this man, he was a student of knowledge. So he used to go around seeking knowledge. He lived at the time of Imam Ghazali. So he used to, he sought some knowledge from Al Ghazali as well. Then he heard about this thing called Mahdi. And he thought it would be a nice thing if I would, if I would become the Mahdi. Okay. He was also Jahmi in his belief. Does anyone know what the Jahmiya are? Does anyone know what the Jahmiya are? Now, Jahmiya are those people who don't believe in Allah's attributes. And they always attribute to Allah things of negative. They don't attribute to Allah things which are positive. And so uh, uh, the Jahmiya, Ibn Tirmid was from the Jahmiya. And he did not like the people at that time who were, who were from Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah in, uh, 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 in that place of Al-Maghrib. 
who are known as the Murabitun. So he raised up his own uh, uh, party, you might say political party, uh, calling himself the Muwahideen, and he proclaimed himself to be the Mahdi. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah mentions in Munar al-Munif that this Mahdi, Mahdi of Maghrib, was the worst Mahdi that can ever, uh, ever come. He used to kill people. He used to kill ulama. Imagine a Mahdi killing ulama, Muslims, subhanAllah. That, 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 in, that in itself is a sign that he's not the Mahdi. He used to rape women. He used to cut children out from the stomachs of their women, uh, from, uh, from, from pregnant women. He used to cut off the breasts of women. And he used to hang it around his neck. He used to, subhanAllah, he did so many things until he even wiped out, all, nearly wiped out the, 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 the Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah, nearly wiped out the Murabitun and, and replaced them with the, with the Muwahidun. Muwahidun, they call them Muwahidun. You know, people upon Tawheed, but really they were not, they were Jahmiyyah. Okay, so this is Ibn Turmat, he died in the year 524 after Hijrah. Then let's move on to Mahdi of Sudan. Now his name was Muhammad Ahmed. A bit, bit, bit different, Muhammad Ahmed bin, bin Abdullah. His name was Muhammad Ahmed, he was from the Sufis. And he, and he used to belong to the Tijani Tariq. So he also learned about the Mahdi and he thought it would be a good way to actually bring people up, bring Muslims back up. And so he proclaimed himself to be the Mahdi and he uh, started to call the people towards his Mahdi ship. And this Mahdi, he wrote in one of his books that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to me whilst I was awake and the Khulafa Rashidin and all the righteous people from the day of Adam until the day of judgment came to me whilst I was awake and they promised me uh, victory and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would aid me with the forces from the heavens and the earth in every war that I do and that I am better than Adam and I'm better than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I'm better than them all. And the Rasulullah himself will come to every battle of mine and fight my battles for me. MashaAllah. Wouldn't we all like that? So this is what he said. This is the Mahdi of Sudan. And alhamdulillah, when he actually started to, uh, when he asked for, uh, you know, he was asking for trouble, obviously, you know, when you write something like this, you're asking for trouble. So when he was asking for trouble, the armies of, of Egypt, uh, uh, declared war on him in the year 1899 after, uh, after the birth of Christ uh, AD and, uh, and in the year uh, 1899 he was killed. This is Muhammad Ahmed uh, At-Tijani, this is the Mahdi of the Sufis, the Mahdi of Sudan. Let's come to the fourth Mahdi and that is the Mahdi of Hind. We can't forget India, can we? We can't, we have to, we have to talk about India, uh, you know, you know the <laughs> Mahdi's from, from India as well. And this is Muhammad al Jonfuri. Muhammad John Furi was one of the most devilish Mahdi's that ever lived. One of the most devilish people who claimed to be the Mahdi's. He was a half of the Quran and he was a student of knowledge and he went and he did Hajj and then when he did Hajj he found that mashallah this idea of Mahdi, he found a book on the Mahdi's and he, and he found that this concept of Mahdi was a good thing to attract people, isn't it? In fact, just look at when, 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 when the brothers uh, uh, you know, put the title of the, of the talk, Countdown to the Mahdi, didn't that attract a lot of people? So, that's, that's just a proof that the, the, that the idea of the Mahdi attracts a lot of people. So he used this concept of the Mahdi and he proclaimed himself to the Mahdi and he made it, he made it a mission to kill all the ulama of Islam. And in fact, the ulama Siddiq Hassan Khan and others mentioned that this man killed so many ulama that he could not even count. Scores and scores of ulama in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh at that time, obviously that part of the world, were wiped out because of the pillages of this man, uh, Muhammad al Jonfuri. And alhamdulillah, he was, he was killed in the year 910 after Hijrah. Then we come to the Mahdi of Saudi Arabia. Mahdi of Saudi Arabia. And this is something that uh, our brother uh, Abu Amina uh, Bilal Phillips had mentioned to me uh, you know, once while, while, while I was uh, speaking to him. And he mentioned to me that when he was a student in the university, uh, this man by the name of uh, Juhayman, as you know, you might have heard of the story. In the year 1979, he, pro he proclaimed himself to be the Mahdi. And he took over Makkah at that time. He took, he took over the, the Kaaba at that time and he proclaimed himself to be the Mahdi. And he mentioned that a lot of students left the university and went to join him. And he said that I was about to go. <laughs> he said I was about to leave and join this Mahdi. SubhanAllah, imagine this. This is the students, you know, the people who are studying. And I told him, you know what, you should have attended my talk on the Mahdi first. <laughs> Perhaps then, inshallah, you, would, you know, as a joke to him, obviously, you know, and, uh, and subhanallah, perhaps that we can be guided, inshallah, when something like this happens. So subhanallah, look at this. When the reality comes and when people do proclaim to the Mahdi, and it is so confusing if you don't know who 
The Mahdi truly is and what the Quran and Sunnah says about the Mahdi. And so this man, the Juhayman Al-Qahtani, his name was Muhammad Al-Juhayman Al-Qahtani, he took over Mecca and he killed all the Hujjaj over there, he killed all the people doing Tawaf and, and Umrah etc. He killed the guards over there until the Kibar Ulema in the, the, the Ulema of Saudi Arabia, they had their fatwa in the year 1979 in which they uh, uh, told the, the Hukuma to, to take whatever measures possible uh, uh, to kill the Mahdi, even if it be by being, bringing the army in and killing the Mahdi, killing this false Mahdi. And as we know as well, uh, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Albani Rahimullah, and also Sheikh Ibn Baz mentioned that the Mahdi, this guy came to them and said, uh, accept my Mahdi Sheikh, you know, I'm the Mahdi, give me bay'ah. And they all said, no, no, they tried to advise him, come here my son, you know, you know, chill out, chill out, you know, you're not the Mahdi yet, you know, it's not, it's not time yet. And, you know, this guy just wouldn't listen. What can, what can you do? You know, Allah Mustafa. Let's move on to those people who the people who Muslims thought they were the Mahdi, but they never themselves pro proclaimed to be the Mahdi. From these people who themselves never proclaimed to be the Mahdi, but the people thought they were the Mahdi, I will talk about two of them. The first is Isa ibn Maryam, radiallahu uh, uh, alayhi salam. Isa ibn Maryam, alayhi salam, there is, an, there is a hadith in Al-Bayhaqi that says, لا مهدي إلا Isa ibn Maryam. There is no Mahdi except Isa ibn Maryam. This hadith, of course, is fabricated or da'if, very, 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 very da'if. In fact, Al-Bayhaqi himself mentioned that it is very, very weak. And so uh, Isa ibn Maryam is one of the people, one of the, uh, the, one of the people who the people will think that he is a Mahdi, however, he himself will never proclaim to be the Mahdi. The second uh, person who the people thought he was a Mahdi, but he was not the Mahdi, and he never proclaimed to be the Mahdi was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. In fact, many of the Salaf, when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz came, as you know, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he came at a time of great, great destruction to his Ummah, at a time in which the, which the Khalifas before him and after him were very, very bad, were very evil Khalifas. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was like a, was like a godsend, you know, he was a uh, mercy to this ummah and so the people thought he must be the Khalifa, he must be the Khalifa until people even went to Al-Hassan al-Basri and went to Sa'id al-Musayyib and other people and said uh, uh, is he the Mahdi and, and they said no he is not the Mahdi but he is a Mahdi he is not the Mahdi that, that Rasulullah proclaimed but no he is a Mahdi as well meaning he is guided and he guides people as well right has the Mahdi been born yet? we have two claims to this the first claim is from the Shia and we know the Shia claim that Mahdi is born already and he has been born, and he is living now, and sometimes he, he takes a, a, you know, he has a picnic, he comes out of his cave, you know, and he comes and meets some, uh, some ulema of the Shia, as we know some of the, some, uh, you know, Khomeini writes that he met the Mahdi, and he came and had a, you know, had some tea with him, had some cake and biscuits, and then he had to leave, so he went back into the cave, and he went, went back into hibernation, and in fact, the Mahdi of the Shia is something which the Shias truly believe in, and if you read about the characteristics of the Mahdi of the Shia in the books of the Shia, which is such as, for example, Al-Kafi, which is one of their major books, which is uh, like, like the Bukhari to us, they have the Al-Kafi. In Al-Kafi, if you look at the attributes of their Mahdi, the, the, the Mahdi will be aided by the Jews, the Mahdi will be, uh, 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 what is it? The Mahdi will be aided by the Jews, the Mahdi will speak Hebrew, etc., etc. And, and if you look at the description of the Mahdi, you will find that they are in fact describing the Dajjal. In fact, it is, why, it is this, for this reason why the ulama of Sunnah believe that the Mahdi of the Dajjal, uh, Mahdi of the Shia, is actually the Dajjal. Not really the proper Mahdi of the Ahl Sunnah al -Jama. Because if you see the attributes of the Dajjal in the authentic Sunnah, and you compare it to the attributes of the Mahdi according to the Shia, you will find a lot of similarities which really truly show that the Mahdi of the Shia will truly be the Dajjal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about that. We come to the point after which the Mahdi will come out. Let's talk about those things that will happen to this Ummah. Three things I will talk about. The three things that will happen to this Ummah just before the coming of the Mahdi. Just before the coming of the Mahdi. And let's see whether these things have happened to us already so that we know whether we should pack our bags right now and get going or, or uh, you know, what, what, should, should, what should we be doing. The first thing that Rasulullah mentioned is that لا تقوم ساعة حتى uh, تكون عهدة There will be an عهدة which is basically means a peace treaty. There will be a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Christians. And this is an authentic hadith which is reported in Musnad Imam Ahmed and Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi and, uh, and, and uh, Ibn Abi Shaybaz, uh, Mus uh, Musannaf and, and, and others. And in it, Rasulullah said that the Sa'a will not come until the Muslims first have a peace treaty with the Christians. 
Now I'm going to ask you this question. Aren't the Muslims, all the Muslim states today, aren't they in a peace treaty with the Christians? Yes or no? So this hadith has already come, hasn't it? Yes. Thereafter, after the peace treaty, will come the, the war of wars. What is this war of wars? It is the Armageddon that, the, that all the scriptures have talked about. So the second thing that Rasulullah talked about in this hadith, he said, وَبَعْدِ الْأُحْدَى تَكُونُ الْمَلْحَمَةَ الْكُبْرَى The great Malhamat al-Kubra, we can say the mother of battles, the war of wars. And contrary to what the Christians believe, but the Sunnah, authentic Sunnah tells us, the authentic Sunnah, listen to this, tells us that the Muslims will join forces with the Christians to fight a common enemy. So this Armageddon is not Muslims against the Christians, no, 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 no. It is the Muslims with the Christians fighting a common enemy. What is this common enemy? Allah knows best. However, we know that this Armageddon will take place in, in which place? It will take place in the lands of Palestine. It will take place in the land of Palestine. Is this common enemy the Jews? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. We don't know. Something we don't know. But it mentions they will come together, join forces to fight a common enemy in the lands of Palestine in this authentic hadith in Musnad Imam Ahmed. In fact, Jimmy Swaggart, as you know, the, the man who debated uh, Didat, and he is an uh, ev evangelist, isn't he? Uh, in America. And he mentions one of his books as well, that I used to think that the Armageddon will come at a different time. However, I'm convinced that all the signs are present that, are, that the Armageddon will come whilst we are uh, still alive. And it will happen in the lands of Palestine, as he mentions from the scriptures, according to his understanding. So we find therefore that, uh, that, uh, that the, the scriptures uh, of the, the Ahli Kitab as well, and our books as well, are in conformity that the Armageddon will take place in the lands of Palestine. In fact, in Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter number 16, it also mentions that the, uh, the, the, the mother of battles will take place in the lands of Palestine. Okay, so this is the Armageddon. In this Armageddon, guys, this, ba this battle of battles will last for four days. And the number of Christians that will be there, as Rasulullah said, is that they will have 80 standards, 80 standards, 80 flags or 80 uh, standards of war. And, and under each standard will be, will be 12,000 men will be 12,000 soldiers, meaning 80 times, uh, 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 80 times 12,000 is about 960,000. So 960,000, pro approximately a million, would be the number of Christians, would be the number of Christians that will fight in this mother of battles, in this mother of battles with the Muslims. And we don't know the, what the number of Muslims will be at that particular battle. If you think about it, if you think about how can that happen, how will the Muslims, will, will the Christians have 960,000 uh, 960, army? If you think about it, Rasulullah used the term room. And room doesn't just mean, doesn't just, doesn't just, you know, practically mean Romans. No, it means the Christians, whether it be America, whether it be Europe, whoever. They all together are, to, are deemed as Christians because they are Christian states. And so if you look at it, the way that this can happen is really through the United Nations, isn't it? As you know, the preemptive strike as, as they are uh, proposing, wherein all the nations will therefore be part of striking a particular nation or striking a particular enemy, and they will all send their armies together. And this is, the, and this is Allah knows best, this is my ishtihad and the ishtihad of some other brothers, that this is the meaning of 80 different standards. As you know, why, why would they have 80 different standards if there was not 80 different armies? True or not? Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what the meaning of this hadith is. However, the number of people that were fighting in this Armageddon is 960. After four days of fighting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory to the Muslims, not the Christians. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory to the Muslims who are fighting in this war against the common enemy. So the Muslims will win. Because of the jealousy in the hearts of the Christians, the Christians will prepare now to attack the Muslims. This 960,000 strong Christians will prepare to attack the Muslims in a duration of which Rasulullah said in a da'if hadith, in a da'if hadith, he said a duration of nine months approximately. A duration of which it takes for a woman to uh, uh, drop her load basically or, or uh, deliver a baby. And this is basically nine months, approximately, isn't it? And this hadith is not authentic. However, so, so we know that there is a, a, du a duration between the finishing of the Armageddon until, until the fight between the Muslims and the Romans. It is in this time that three of the children of the Khalifa in Arabia, three of the children of the Khalifa in Arabia, who are they? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, who are three of the children of the Khalifa in Arabia will be fighting over the throne in Arabia. At that time, the Mahdi will emerge and the people will give bayat to him and 
that army will come from, the, from Damascus, as we, as we will take very soon. The army will come from Damascus to, to fight him and they will be swallowed up by the earth. So it is in this time, just before the great battle between the Muslims and the Christians uh, will take place, that Mahdi will emerge. Now let's move on to the most important part of this talk and that is what are the authentic characteristics of the Mahdi in the authentic Quran and Sunnah? What are they? They are 25. They are 25 in number. Taking from 30 authentic hadith and 16 authentic narrations from the companions. And you know many people have many different narrations that they have understood from them. Uh, different attributes of the Mahdi as you know. Uh, uh, Ibn Kathir rahimullah in his book as well. He mentions many narrations and he uses a lot of uh, you know, da'if hadith as well. In, in this uh, uh, research report I have summarized a lot of what the ulama have said from Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, uh, uh, Shaykh Albani's checking of the hadith. Uh, uh, Ahmed Shakir's checking of the, of the Muslim, etc, etc. We have summarized 46 authentic hadith, uh, 46, uh, 30 hadith and 16 authentic narrations. 25 points of benefit from the authentic hadith of Rasulullah and the authentic narrations from the, from the Salah, Sahaba uh, regarding the characteristics of the Mahdi. What are they? First and foremost, that his name is similar to the name of Rasulullah which is Muhammad That is the name of the Mahdi. His name will be Muhammad. His father's name is the same as Rasulullah's father's name, which is Abdullah. He will be from the family of Rasulullah. He will be from the children of Fatima, from the progeny of Al Hassan, not Hussein. The, the hadith that says Hussein is not authentic. Also, the hadith that says that the mother of this Mahdi will be Amina is also not authentic. Okay. He will have a prominent forehead. Okay. His forehead will be prominent, meaning his hair will be drawn back and then so his head is his forehead is protruding and he will have a long pointed nose with a crooked edge in the middle long imagine my low nose you know like long and pointed no not, not that long long and pointed but crooked in the middle okay and then number six allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prepare him in one night meaning that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him in one night or one hour as another narration says what does this mean as mullah ali qari in his risala mahdi he mentions that the mahdi will initially not Agree that he's a Mahdi. Initially, he will not agree that he's a Mahdi. The people will come to him and the ulama will come to him and say he is a Mahdi and he should take up the Khalifa, Khilafah of the, of the Muslims. However, he will not accept it. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that particular night will, will cure him from his, uh, from his desire of not taking uh, the position of authority. And after that night, he will declare that yes, I have decided to take on the position of authority of the Muslimin, become the Khalifa of the Muslimin. And that is what is meant by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changing his heart in one night, in one uh, a particular night. Number seven, before his coming, the earth will be filled with transgression and dhulm. Number eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after his coming, the, after the coming of this uh, Khilafah, the Mahdi, it will be filled with goodness and justice. Number nine, uh, he will be given bay'atu between the Rukun, uh, Rukun al, al, al Yamani and between the Maqam Ibrahim. And this is an authentic hadith in Abi Dawud that Rasulullah had said that the man in my ummah will be given bay'atu between these two places. So he will stand between the Maqam Ibrahim and Rukun Yamani and he will be given bay'atu by the people just as Rasulullah was given bay'atu uh, at the time when he conquered Mecca. Number 10, he will rule for seven years. The hadith, hadith that states eight or nine is not authentic and it is a mistake from the narrator. What is authentic is that he will rule for seven years. After the seven years, he will die. After he dies, we, we Muslims we will pray over him and then bury him. As for the hadith that states that he will be buried next to the grave of Rasulullah and that there is a place of, you know, free for him, then this is not authentic. Number 11, he will come just at the end of time, meaning he will come just before the major signs of the last hour start. As we know, the Mahdi is not from the major signs of the last hour. Okay? There is a point of benefit here that, that you need to think about. The Mahdi will have global consequences, isn't it? He will bring a global change to this earth, isn't it? Yet he is from the lesser signs of the hour. He is not from the major signs of the hour. Do you understand? The Mahdi is from the lesser signs of the hour. He is the last of the lesser signs of the hour. In fact, after him, what will come are the major signs. And, the, and that which is, uh, which is clear about the major signs, as, as Ibn Hajar mentions, is that the major signs will come one after the other in quick succe succession. So the Dajjal will come straight away, the east of the Madin will come straight away, the Yajuj Ma'jud will come straight away, the sun will rise from the east, uh, uh, rise from the west. Uh, uh, all the other way around, I'm a bit confused at the moment. <laughs> and, and, then, and then 
straight away the beast from Kaaba will come out and straight away the, you, you know what I mean? It's going to be in quick, quick, quick progression. Allah subhanahu knows best. In fact, Ibn Hajar rahimullah, he mentioned that it may be that all of this will happen one day. In the length of which is one day, Allah subhanahu knows best whether he is right or not. Number 12, the, uh, an, an army with black standards will come from the direction of Khurasan and he will be with them. The hadith that states that Mahdi will come from Medina is not authentic. The hadith that states that there will be an earthquake in Medina and then he will come from Medina. As, as, as it is reported, this hadith is in Abi Dawud. This is not an authentic hadith. Shaykh al-Bani made this da'if. Okay, number 13, that rain will, will be plentiful. There will be a lot of, lot of rain. Number 14, that the, pro, that the crops and produce of the land will be plentiful. There will be a lot of crops. Hmm? A lot of produce in the land. Number 15, the number of livestock will be a lot. There will be a lot of cattle. Number 16, the Ummah will be strong and will prevail. And the Mahdi will win every single war that he fights. Subhanallah, not a single war would he fight except that he will win it. Subhanallah. Allahumma ajil bihi. Okay, number 17. Rome will be conquered at a time in which the number of Romans will be large in number. Romans will be conquered, Rome will be conquered, the Christians will be conquered by the Mahdi at a time when the Christians, number of Christians are huge in number, large in number. Allah subhanahu wa knows best what, what Rasulullah Sallam meant by that. Will they be greater than the, than the Muslim in number? Does that mean whether their army will be greater than the Muslim in number? Allah knows best, but the Romans will be conquered at a time in which the, the Romans are large in number. Number, number 18, three sons of the, of the Khalifa will fight over the throne at the time of his coming. Three sons of the Khalifa will fight over the throne this is an authentic hadith in uh, um, uh, Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. Number 19, he will give money correctly and plentifully. He will give it to the right people and he will give too much of it or a lot of it. And whenever he gives a lot, he does not ask for anything back. Number 20, the Dajjal will come uh, in his time and, and will corner him in Damascus. And this will happen after the Muslims have won the war with the Christians. We will come to that very, very soon. Number 21, Isa ibn Maryam, Isa alayhi salam will come in his time and pray behind him and kill the Dajjal, and also uh, take care of the Juj who will come out as well. Number 22, he is from the 12 rightly guided Khalifs in the Hadith of Bukhari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Rasulullah mentioned in authentic Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that the, the last hour will not come until 12 rightly guided Khalifs rule over this Ummah. 12. Okay, rightly guided Khalifs rule over this Ummah. Of course, this is different from the Aqeedah the Shia of the Ithna Sharia who believe that there will be 12 Imams. No, but Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah also believe that there will be 12 Imams. Uh, Allah knows best whether they have come already, meaning, did, did Rasulullah uh, you know, mean by the 12 Imams the four Khalifas and also the ones who came after him, such as Abdullah ibn Zubair, such as, for example, uh, uh, Walid, etc., etc., uh, Walid ibn Muawiyah, etc., etc. Did Rasulullah mean by them? Uh, what did, what did Rasulullah truly mean by the 12 Khalifas? The ulama have differences amongst them, but many of the ulama believe that the last of the 12 Khalifas, or the rightly guided Khalifas, will be the Mahdi. Number, th number 23, an army that will come to attack him will be swallowed up by the earth. This is an army of Muslims. And I will come to that very soon. But this, this army that will be swallowed up is an authentic hadith uh, uh, that has been mentioned by Rasulullah Sallallahu in uh, Ibn Majah. Number 24, he will be 52 years of, all, years of age. The time of coming, his age will be 52 years. Number 25, so if you've seen a Mahdi, if he's still, you know, he's still doing tawaf, if you might have seen him when you go for hajj, you've got a couple of years to wait. Okay, number 25. The battle of battles, Armageddon will take place just before his time. Just before his time. Okay, so this is 25 authentic uh, uh, attributes of the Mahdi that has been found in the authentic Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallam. What happens after the Mahdi comes? Let's come to the events when the Mahdi is here with us. The Mahdi will, fi will, 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 will fight five wars. Okay, the authentic hadith of Rasulullah Sallam mentioned that the Mahdi will fight how many? Five wars. The first one, he won't even fight. The first one is when the Mahdi has emerged, then the, uh, a huge army from Damascus will be sent to fight him and kill him. And this is an army of Muslims. However, when it is approaching Medina, when it is in a clear land, in a place which is a desert, al bayda Rasulullah mentioned al bayda Bayda basically means uh, a, a desert, basically means a clear land, desert, white sand, desert. They will be swallowed up by the earth. In fact, this is the, is, the, is the sure sign of the Mahdi. This is the only sure sign of the Mahdi. And it is for this reason why Sufyan al-Thawri radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned in authentic narration from him in, uh, in Mustadrak al-Hakim, he mentioned that 
if the Mahdi were to pass by in front of your house, don't join him. He said, what? If the Mahdi was to pass by in front of your house, don't join him until the army gets swallowed up and until the people uh, congregate around him. So this is the time in which you should join him. So Alhamdulillah, we know that. So next time you hear somebody is declared to be the Mahdi, just put him in the loony bin. You know what the loony bin is? What's the loony bin, guys? A mental hospital, yeah, we call it the loony bin in Australia. Anyway, so put him in the mental hospital because he's not truly the Mahdi. Okay, so this, the sign that you should be looking for is the army that is swallowed up in the desert. This is the first war that will happen at that time. Of course, he will not even fight anything at, it, uh, at all in it. Thereafter, when the Muslims see that, and they know therefore that that is definitely the Mahdi, the Ahlul Ilm will see that, the scholars or ulama will all see that, they will try and give bay'ah to him, he will not accept it. In one night, Allah will change his heart, and he will accept the bay'ah, and he will accept uh, uh, to be the Khalifa, and thereafter, he will start the following wars. The first battle that, that he will fight is that he will conquer Arabia. Remember, the Arabian states don't want him to be the Mahdi. So it's, 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 it's politics, isn't it, guys? It's politics. They don't want to lose their throne. So the Mahdi will take over Arabia. As Rasulullah said in the authentic hadith in Bukhari, Arab. The time will not, the hour will not come until you take over and you fight the Arabian Peninsula. So you take over the land of the Arabs, which is the Arabian Peninsula. ثُمَّ تَغْزُونَ الْفُرْسِ فَيَفْتَحُ اللَّهِ And then after you will fight the force, which is Iran. Basically perhaps the Shia, Allah knows best what, what Rasulullah meant by this. But we will fight this place, which is Iran, which is around Iraq and Iran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open, it up, open up for us, meaning give us victory. Thereafter, Rasulullah said, after Iran, you will fight the ثُمَّ تَغْزُونَ الرُّومِ then you will fight the Romans, meaning the Christians. فَيَفْتَحُهُ اللَّهِ And Allah will give you victory. ثُمَّ تَغْزُونَ الدَّجَّالِ Then you will fight the Dajjal. فَيَفْتَحُهُ اللَّهِ And Allah will give you victory. Five battles in this authentic hadith. So the first one we mentioned was what? The, the army that gets swollen up. The second one is when, you, when the Mahdi will take over the Arabian Peninsula. The third one is battle over Iran. Number four is the battle over Rum. The battle over, over Rome is amazing because Rasulullah sallallahu said in another authentic hadith from Abu Huraira in Musnad Abu Huraira in the Musnad of, uh, of, of Imam Ahmed. He said, لا, ي- لا تقوم ساعة حتى تجتمع, حتى يجتمع الروم في uh, دابغ. In this place called دابغ. In أعماق أو دابغ as in the hadith states. أعماق أو دابغ. Where is this place called أعماق and دابغ? If you go back to the uh, books of geography that the, that the scholars of Muslims have talked about. Amak and Dabit is in a place which is between Aleppo in Syria and, uh, and Ankara in Turkey. And if you look at the, the map today, you can see that, as you know, America is trying to take over and, and put its forces in the, in the Mediterranean and, and, and in a part of Turkey, isn't it? And obviously, as you know, you've been reading in the newspapers that the Congress has been told all the time it's been bombarded with, with, uh, with, with uh, stories about how Syria is a terrorist nation. And as you know, the axis of evil can only mean that Syria will be next in line. So when Syria is taken over, you will see them, the, the forces of the Americans congregated in this place. And this is what Rasulullah said, and we believe that will definitely happen. We believe that will definitely happen. Okay, so Amak and Dabiq is a place between Syria and Turkey, and this will be taken over by the Romans or the Christians. And this is the place where they will, uh, they will be fought by the Muslimin. So, therefore, the battle number four is that the Mahdi will send a huge number of army from Medina. And, and this army that goes out of Medina is the best of the fighters at that time. And they will go and meet this army from the Christians. However, Rasulullah mentioned that the one who will lead the battle, who will, won, who will win the battle over the Romans, is Banu Ishaq. Now, my question to those people who are budding historians about the Arabian Peninsula and about the Arabian tribes, is there a Banu Ishaq in Arabia? MashaAllah, so people know about it? No, there is no Banu, Banu Ishaq in Arabia. So what is Rasulullah Sallam talking about? The ulama mentioned that Banu Ishaq is from Banu Ishaq bin Salul, who will be a tribe that will, uh, 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 that will leave the Christians and join the Muslims. Meaning, a group from the Christians, the Christian army will, will leave them, accept Islam and join the Muslims. 
So Rasulullah ﷺ said that the reason for the battle between the Muslims and Christians is because the, uh, 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 the Muslims, the, the Christian army will say, we don't want to fight you Muslims, we only want to fight these people who have left us. And the Muslims will say, La wallahi, we will never leave our brothers. We will never leave our brothers and this will be the reason for the war. Of course, how the war started would be that a man from the Christians would raise his salib, the cross and say, Ghalab al-Salib, the, the salib has won. And the Muslims, and the Muslim, uh, a man amongst the Muslims will kill that man. And because of this, the huge battle will start. Because of this, a huge battle will start that will last for seven days. And it will be so intense, it will be so intense that even a bird flying over the sky cannot, cannot pass the battlefield except that it will be shot down. That it will be shot down. Allah knows best, you know, uh, how dangerous that battle will be. However, it will be the, one of the greatest battles this world has ever known. And after this battle, one third of the Muslims will run away. In fact, during this battle, one third of the Muslims will run away. And they are the traitors, and they are the munafiqeen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah Rasul said, Allah will never forgive them. Allah will never forgive them, meaning that they will revert away, they will become murtad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore will never forgive them because of their shirk. And because they ran away from the battle. Then there will be another one third who will die. So one third runs away, and one third dies, and they are the best of the shuhada. And this is an authentic hadith in Musnad. And another one third will win and Allah will give them victory over the Romans. Thereafter, when Allah has given victory to the Romans, to the, to the Muslims over the Romans, a messenger will come to the Mahdi at that time and say that the Jal has come. As soon as the battle is finished, remember, they haven't even wiped their swords clean. The Mahdi, the Dajjal has come. And Rasulullah ﷺ said at that time, the Mahdi will send 10 of the knights of Muslims, the best Ferocious war, warriors amongst the Muslims. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in the authentic hadith of Muslim, Wallahi, I know their names and the names of their fathers and I know the color of their faces and I know the size of their, uh, their height and their weight. I know every single thing about them. These 10 warriors who are the greatest fighters at that time, the greatest mujahideen at that time will go and face the Dajjal on their own after which the, uh, the Mahdi will try and fight the Dajjal. When the Mahdi tries and fights the Dajjal, and this is the fifth battle that he will fight, he will be cornered in Damascus, after which, of course, Isa ibn Maryam will come down, and he will not lead the prayer. The Mahdi will lead him in the prayer, and then the Isa ibn Maryam will take care of the Dajjal for us, alhamdulillah. That is, I think, uh, uh, our brother Khalid Yassin's talk, perhaps, and he can uh, uh, delve more, more on that, inshallah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, there are certain important points. We have just taken everything about the Mahdi now. There are certain important points for us to realize before we say uh, so-and-so is a Mahdi. The first important point that we need to realize, brothers and sisters in Islam, is that he will not claim to be the Mahdi or never call the people to his Mahdi-ship. And this is a term I've made up myself. Mahdi-ship. I don't know how to, how to say it. Mahdiya. Mahdawiya, as we say in Arabic. Mahdi-ship. Okay? He will not call people to say that he's a Mahdi. He will not do that. In fact, he will stay away from it. And this is a sign of, of righteousness and sincerity. When a person is being offered to take on the position, he doesn't take it. And this is from righteousness and sincerity. And this is a sign of the Mahdi and that he will not accept it. So if there's a person who comes up in our midst or someone after listening to this talk say, okay, therefore now, alhamdulillah, I know everything about the Mahdi. Let me just declare that I'm the Mahdi. Well, the Mahdi will never declare himself to be the Mahdi and he will never call to it. It is only the people who will point to him and say he is the Mahdi. Number two, believing that a particular person is the Mahdi is not from the Shahada. It's not from power of Tawheed. Meaning, if a person, you don't believe a particular person is a Mahdi, and he might be the Mahdi, doesn't mean you're still not a Muslim. You're still a Muslim. Okay? You're still a Muslim. It is not like Rasulullah It is not a matter of Risala. It is a matter of, of, of just taking the Mahdi as your leader. So you're still a Muslim, even if you don't think the Mahdi is, the, is a Mahdi. Number three, we don't need to know who the Mahdi is. We don't need to. We should already be fighting for Islam. We should already be struggling for this religion. Already be working in beneficial projects for the upliftment, uh, upliftment of Islam in UK and in the world. Subhanallah. And we don't need to know who the Mahdi is. Truly, we have no need for this. It is just good to know that Allah subhanahu wa victory will come in His hands and that He will definitely win every single war and, and He will fill the world with, with Adil just as the world was filled with uh, uh, before him and number four it is not permissible to say when the Mahdi is definitely coming 
it is not permissible to say the Mahdi has been born. It is not permissible to say when the Mahdi is definitely coming. Why? Because the Mahdi will come just before the great signs of the hour. So to say that the, you know when the Mahdi is coming is transgression upon the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a knowledge which Rasulullah has not told us. It is a knowledge which the Quran and Sunnah has kept quiet from. So we don't know exactly when the Mahdi will be coming. So to say the Mahdi has been born, or that the Mahdi is alive now, or that the Mahdi is, is uh, doing tawaf now around Mecca, uh, around the Kaaba, etc., etc., or that, you know, etc., I saw him near the grave of the Prophet, etc., all of this are lies, are not true, cannot be true. Uh, in conclusion, brothers and sisters in Islam, we say that we hope, of course, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he brings the coming of the Mahdi close. And that like the earth will be filled with dhun before that it is filled with justice and hope. However, brothers and sisters in Islam, the message today from this talk today is that we should stop the coming of the Mahdi. We should prevent the coming of the Mahdi. What do I mean by that? What am I saying? I'm saying prevent his coming because as you know, the Mahdi will not come until the earth will be filled with transgression and dhulm. And the only thing that we need to do, brothers and sisters in Islam, in order for the world to be filled with transgression and dhulm and evil, is for us to do nothing. Is for us to sit back and do nothing. As you know, Edmund Burke, one of the thinkers of the West, he had said, the only essential thing, the only essential thing for evil to, to prevail in this world is for righteous men, good men to do nothing. So it is when good men do nothing, brothers and sisters in Islam, when good men do nothing, good men, the Muslimin, the righteous Muslimin, they do nothing. That is the time when evil will prevail and that is the time the Mahdi will come. So please stop the Mahdi from coming. Please stop the Mahdi from coming. Do something so that the evil does not spread in this world. Rise up and work for this religion so that the Mahdi doesn't need to come in order to uh, uh, bring this world into, uh, uh, into change, change the situation of the world from the dhulm into uh, the goodness and just, justice that will be filled after him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhana laka Allahumma wa yihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeem.